How should the church respond to mental illness? And are there some things a church can do to help people that are battling some of these issues? This is what we're going to talk about today on Life Questions. My name is Jeff Milslego, and I'm sitting in for Bill Harris. Once again, I'm joined by four area local pastors. We're going to go ahead and get these gentlemen introduced here pretty quick. Uh, to my immediate right here, we got uh, Pastor Dave Burkhart from Westminster United Methodist Church. Also, Rich Reiki, the Director of International Ministries, Teens for Christ. Jason Goss of the Wapak Church, and finally, Pastor Neil Whitney with the church at Allentown. Okay, gentlemen, so this is a, uh, a question that has somewhat a bit of a stigma, I think, that's attached to it, which is probably why the, uh, why the uh, person who wrote this is, is asking us this question. So let me read this. How can we normalize mental health conversations in the church? We are quick to reach out to people with cancer, surgeries, even family situations, but there isn't a lot of help for people struggling with mental health. What do we do about that? Well, I, th I think the first thing is it's moving in the right direction. Ah. So in the sense of uh, 20 years ago, breast cancer was taboo. Now you can't go anywhere without seeing pink shirts and pink yes. ribbons. And it's normal to talk about something that was a part of a woman's body that you didn't mention in public. And so I think- Especially in church. Yes. Especially yeah, yeah. in church. Yeah. So now the conversation is moving forward and I think it's happening. But specifically as far as church members, I think the biggest thing for us as clergy and, and as leaders in the church is to be vulnerable about our own struggles mm -hmm. and to treat the vulnerability of others with care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when people are going through struggles to treat it as any other illness, to treat it as any other disease. It happens to be in your mind, not in your foot or not in your kidney, but it's just as significant and it's okay to pray about it. Yeah. So why do you think there's this bit of a stigma about this? Because just, you know, when, it, when someone does have a issue, you know, cancer issue, it does seem like they can often get a lot of people to rally around them, but maybe not so much with this. Why is that? Well, I think it's probably uh, it has more to do with uh, lack of understanding than anything else. Um, there's just so much that we don't understand about how the mind works and, and um, you know, how we think and, mm. and how to overcome some of these issues. And, mm -hmm. and some of them, you know, we just need help to overcome them. Yeah. Uh, yes. You can't do it on your own. You couldn't, you couldn't heal, um, you know, like say a, a appendix on your own. You mm. have to get some help to, to get that operated on, taken out mm -hmm. and, and proceed on then. So, so the uh, question actually is, how do we normalize mental health conversations? How do we go about that, Pastor Jason? Well, I, I think talking about it is the biggest, the biggest issue. You have to be honest about it. And I think that when there's something that we don't know, we tend to shy away from it. Mm. We don't want to talk about it because as a pastor, if I don't have all the facts about something, I'm kind of hesitant to, to necessarily dive into it because I don't know everything yet. Mm -hmm. So until... I've done the study or I've tell churches have done the study until we have that issue, then that's a, that's a different issue. I'm not going to just run and talk about something because then what happens is something new comes out and then my information was incorrect. I think we saw that, some of that with the government this year that, mm, yeah. you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how about Pastor Whitney? There was a time when if you had a mental health issue that you were separated from society. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how much of that is still carrying over into our culture, but some of it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know because I'm older than most people, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. and, and that could easily be passed on as a very negative thing. Mm -hmm. And we have to work to eliminate that negativity. So, so what does that look like? Have to work to eliminate that negativity. How, how do we actually do that? as pastors, as leaders in churches? Number, I, go ahead. Number one thing for me would be compassion. Uh, Dave or mentioned care, care mm -hmm. for people. So compassion, mm -hmm. compassion. My goodness, we need to have the same compassion for everybody mm -hmm. and not separate a certain group of people because they have something different. Mm -hmm. When you have an illness, there's no difference. An illness is an illness, a, a disease is dis-ease of your body or yeah. your mind. Yes. So you need to put people at ease and compassion for me is the best way to do that. So in a practical matter, what does that look like? Well, I, I think we need to maybe normalize the idea of getting help. 
people are afraid to ask for help because mm. if I ask for help, that means there's something wrong with me. Well, if there's a mental health issue, something is wrong. Mm. If you've got a cold, something is wrong with your body. Uh, if your marriage is, there's issues, something's wrong. Uh, we've said constantly, you know, it's easier to tune things up than it is to deal with a breakdown. Sure, yes. But, but yes. we're so afraid to, to ask for help, to, to say, hey, I, I don't feel comfortable. Something's not right. Well, let's get help. I, I believe, I don't know the exact statistics, but it's somewhere north of 80% of mental health care facilities are, we've got less than we did 20 years ago. So I think we're seeing a spike in the mental health thing is because we're now, we haven't been treating it like we used to. We haven't been dealing with it. We haven't been talking about it. So mm. we need help. Hmm. Hmm. I, I think another really important aspect of this whole thing is that we as pastors have to be vulnerable ourselves. Um, I know um, I went through some mental health issues. Um, I, I had terrible, terrible anger issues for a long time in my mm. life. And, and, and it was almost as though there were demons in me. And, and mm. you know these fits of rage would come out and and i just needed to get some help um i know one of our questions on here talks about using medication and and i used medication uh because because i needed it to get over that hump and mm. and once i was able to get through that then life became so much better it was, mm. yeah you know when we deal with our with our um mental health issues we can change people's lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, a, a little vulnerability like that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. People can say, you know, maybe I'm not just crazy. Maybe it's something going on. Yeah, maybe something, yeah. Pastor Reiki? Well, and I think that's important what Dave hit on is it's a, it's a holistic approach to how we deal with it. Whether we're talking about teenagers who are dealing with anxiety or somebody struggling with depression and needing medication or whatever it is, we, you have to take a spiritual approach there's a spiritual aspect to this. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there are some circles of Christianity where any mental health issue is a demon. And so some would say any physical thing is a demon. Right. Um, and then there's the other side where it's all scientific. It's all, we live in the natural world and, and none of that stuff matters. And so we're only gonna run to a doctor. We're only gonna run to a counselor. And I, we have to be holistic and say, look, there's a spiritual component here. How big that is is on a case to case basis. There's a, a, a relational component here that might be addressed with a counselor and walking through issues and giving somebody some tools and it might be Christian discipleship. And then there's a physical component that may or may not be at play as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we, we need not shy away from any of those mm -hmm. right. and have a care t plan, a care team in place that addresses all those components. And where I find people struggle the most in my congregation, people that I've dealt with in the congregation, with students at Teens for Christ, with soldiers in the guard, where I'm a chaplain, is when they pick the one that fits them and they run to that. If I just get a pill, it's gonna make me better. Doesn't work. Mm. If I just pray hard enough, it's gonna make me better. Doesn't right. work. If I just go to enough counseling sessions, I'm gonna get better. Doesn't work. You gotta take a full spectrum approach. Mm. Mm. Isaiah 61 3 says that we're supposed to take uh, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair mm. or a spirit of heaviness. So it, it's not just praising, to, but it's also some of it, it, it might be medication. Mm. It might be talking to someone. And I think, I think you hit the nail on the head that it's, it can't be just, well, I'm only gonna do this or it's only this. It's a balanced approach. It, it might, I might need a little bit of all of it. The point is, you guys are all getting to, this is a real problem. Yeah. We're not just dismissing it. I mean, it's just like any other disease. We're just saying there, there are things we need to do and to tackle it and not allow that stigma that you talked about earlier just kind of follow us around. It kind of brings us to the next question here. You mentioned the uh, medication here. It says, an alarming number of teenagers are on anxiety-related medicine. This is not a statement against medicine. Rather, it is a concern for the future of these teens as anxiety can get worse with increased adult responsibilities. How can we reach out to these kids out and kids now and give them hope as they grow up in very stressful times? As a youth pastor for 19 years, one of the things that I found is you have to be honest with your students. Ah. The, the problem is we try to hide a lot of things. You know, as, as, a, as you're grazing a child, one of the one questions they ask is why, 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 why? And, and you have to, so, because I said so, is, is usually an answer we give. <laughs> but at some point in their growing up maturing, they ask why. You need to explain to them why. Mm. They need to begin to understand. You can't just go, all of a sudden you're 18, go, good luck. Mm. There should be a preparation of 
hey, let me help you understand why we do finances this way, or let me help you understand how we deal with issues. And I think sometimes we try to hide that from our students, and that's a danger to them because it's not helping them prepare for what the world is gonna offer once they're an adult, and now you have responsibilities, and now you have to pay your own bills. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can help them make that stuff. Now that doesn't mean we, we throw them out, you know, everything, but, but nurture them and grow and help them walk with those questions. So rather than just throwing a pill at them or something, there's a lot of communication that right. needs to be involved in here, right? Well, and let's really, let's face it, uh, our teens are dealing with so much more in this world that we're living in. Yeah, than, than I mean, just social to, when, media, just that is just so, yeah, because I don't know about y'all, but, but you probably had some of that, but I never had any of that dealing with that growing up. So yeah, it's all different now, isn't it? It is way different. I, I had uh, related to what you're talking about with social media and media in general, is overstimulation yeah. Yeah. as a key cause of anxiety. Mm -hmm. There's never a down moment. So one of the prescriptions that I would have is related to uh, what Pastor Jason was saying is that you, you help them to develop healthy rhythms of life where there's time away from devices, there's yeah. time away from social media, there's time of prayer, there's time of reflection, there, you know, that you build that into their teen years, their tween years, and younger, you know, in elementary school, so that when they're yeah. adults, they already have healthy patterns in place of withdrawing from those things and not needing constant stimulus. And unfortunately, the last couple of years, what have we done? We've just driven kids to be more right. uh, paying attention to a screen, you know. I understand you've got a and bunch then, of reasons And some for of that it, anxiety but, comes to play because yes. I don't know how to have interpersonal relationships. I don't know how to talk to people. The only way I know how to talk to people is I text them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. am I really conveying emotions? Am I understanding how someone feels by, by looking at them? No. So yeah. there's a danger there. There, there sure is. All right. All right. I got one more question here on this, and then we're going to uh, take a break here in a bit. But uh, okay, okay, this is mentions a November 2021. So it's a recent Barna survey indicates that 38% of pastors have thought about quitting full time ministry in the past year. There's no question the full time ministry is an occupation that comes with a struggle as a pastor. How, how do you guys keep going? How can we in the church? So let's just think of someone in your church asking this question. How can we in the church be an encouragement to you, to you guys? I, I'll, I'll start. I'll kick off the ball rolling. Um, the, the biggest struggle has been the last year, I think for me, is I can't fix the problem. Mm. When people come to me and they say, Pastor, I'm, I'm struggling in my marriage or I'm struggling raising my kids, I can help them in that process. When they come to me and say, um, I'm dealing with you know, the COVID issue or my government issue or whatever, I can't take that away. Mm -hmm. I can't fix it. I can't, I, you know, I can give you a biblical perspective maybe, but I can't, I can't solve, you know, your, your job now wants to fire you because you don't, you know, take a, a, a vaccine. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, I can't fix So there's a weight there. And then you get onto that, that there's a weight when it comes to people don't like if what you say doesn't line up with what they think. Yes. Yes. Pastor Whitney, how can people in your congregation be an encouragement to you? Oh, I'm all about serving. Yeah. I believe that Jesus came here to seek and save the lost, to serve and not be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's yeah. right out of the Bible. And that's how I try to live my life. And if someone wants to make me feel better about my life, I guess if they would do the same thing Jesus did, that lines up with what I'm doing. And then we have a, a vision, we have a focus, and we're on a mission. And the things that we can't control, we yeah. just leave alone and focus on the things that can make a difference. There, there's probably a lot more we could discuss on that. So we're going to take a brief break. When we come back, we'll continue this discussion here on Life Questions. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion.
We are continuing our conversations talking about how we can encourage people, particularly our pastors, in their ministry. Okay, Pastor Dave and uh, Pastor Rich, right, both of you didn't answer anything the last time. How can we, just imagine this, guys. Okay, just all jump in here. Okay, you, you have a chance to address somebody in your con congregation, and they just want to know, it's just us four here and the four walls, okay? How, how can we help you? How can we encourage you? Because statistics are really bad with with pastors being discouraged and everything else. How, how can we help? Yeah, I gotta say, I, uh, and I brag on my church all the time, but I've really got a wonderful church, a bunch of people that are, are really a blessing to me. They're very encouraging. And, and, and it, you know, I would encourage people that, uh, that are, are laity within the church, just really encourage a pastor. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that I thrive on, I guess yeah. I'd have to say, and, and um, just my personality. So, so and, what, what encourages you? Um, the, the fact that uh, I hear a lot of times that, um, that we're a, a, a Bible-centered church, and, and it's just awesome to hear our pastor preaching from the Bible. Mm. Um, that kind of stuff encourages me. Mm -hmm. when, when I ask someone to serve on an administrative board position and someone says yes, yeah. uh, it, without hesitation, you know, it, it just shows me that, that they're really excited about the church and about serving God in mm -hmm. ways that, um, because I'm not going to ask somebody to do something that I don't think they can handle or that I don't think they're, mm -hmm. they're equipped for. And so, um, yeah, when I hear people just say yes, um, and, and that goes in ministry opportunities as yes. well, like Pastor Neil was talking about. Um, you know, when I see people that are willing to get out of their seats in the church and go serve God, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's what excites me and that's mm -hmm. what keeps me going. How about for you, Pastor Ricky? I, I would say a similar thing to piggyback on that is when we see people in the congregation displaying Christian character. And so specifically, as it relates to the nuts and bolts, do we, do we treat people well in board meetings? Oh. Do we go to the parking lot and gossip? Right, right. If we're gossiping in the parking lot, then we're also gossiping in the grocery store. If we're talking bad about others in the church, if we're talking bad about um, the pastor, where people can be an encouragement to me as a pastor is we're biblically addressing that. Hey, mm -hmm. we probably shouldn't be talking about this. If you have an issue, Matthew 18, let's go and confront the person and let's deal with it individually. And if, you know, if we need to take somebody else with us, then address it. But, but let's, let's, recognize that our pastor is on the same team as us. Yeah. They're not the enemy. And I came to Galatians 6, whoever wrote this question might want to go there. Galatians 6, the first few verses, brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch over yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. How can you bear the burdens of your pastor? If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. If you think you know more than your pastor, maybe you got another thing coming. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who mm. teaches. Mm -hmm. So there's generosity, there's compassion, there's recognizing that your pastor doesn't just work one day a week, one hour a week, that... We all know probably colleagues that milk the system, but by and large what I see are my colleagues, pastors, wearing themselves out for the kingdom, mm -hmm. going above and beyond mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the sheep in their congregation. Have you guys seen any of your friends or acquaintances or previous schoolmates or whatever that have just gone through this or just been so, I, burnout is a word we throw on a lot, but I mean, I've really suffered under this. I, I think it's a balance that I know I've had to correct maybe, but I know that a lot of pastors, I sink more time into the church, into the people than we do sometimes even our own family. Mm. And that's hard because, uh, especially if I know my family, I know they're taken care of. I know the, the eternal, you know, uh, destination for my family. I know they're, they're serving God. And then I'm dealing with people who are not. So I'm going to put all my energy there because to me, that's a big deal. So uh, finding that balance can be mm -hmm. hard for a pastor. So if you're, if you have a pastor that are they spending a lot of time with the church and are they neglecting their family then and be an encouragement to them, mm -hmm. pastor, you need to go spend time with your family. Now, I, now I've heard uh, uh, pastors, not any of you gentlemen, but basically tell me how the holidays are just so hard. 
is because there's so much that's that's you know placed on on you guys all the different special things you got to do and everything else it's christmas and of course and then it happens again just a handful of months later mm -hmm. you know around easter pastor whitney how do you deal with that how do you deal with all the extra pressure during the holiday seasons plan ahead <laughs> plan ahead yeah that's all mm -hmm. i don't feel extra pressure during a holiday season it's, oh, okay. it's a time of celebration yeah you plan ahead you enjoy the time and if you're feeling pressured, then just plan better. Mm. Bottom line, mm. people procrastinate and put things off, and it becomes self-inflicted <laughs> pressure. So plan ahead. Okay. The Bible right. teaches I, that. Not, not only that, but but find those people who are um, who are creative and willing to serve, and they're, they're in your church. And sometimes they're just not serving because they haven't been asked yet. Mm -hmm. And um, and a lot of times people just won't step up on their own. So yeah. so I'm all about finding those people who can who can help in those situations. And, and I've got great people that can do that. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Man, that takes a lot of the burden off yeah. of a pastor. Yeah. And so. The statistics okay. though are actually worse than this study bears. A number of years ago, there was a study that came out of New England that said 90% of pastors who begin in ministry will not end in ministry. Wow. 90%, there's That's... a 90% fallout rate. And for a variety of reasons, some of that is sin, some of that is I misunderstood my calling, nobody told me that I could be a, a Christian on, on mission in the business world, and I thought the only way to serve God was to become a pastor, so I misunderstood. Some of that is the normal stuff of falling to sin. Some of that is church people sometimes aren't the nicest. Hmm. Surprisingly, I know that Sad. might shock some people, but sometimes church people aren't the nicest. And if you have a pastor who's humble, and you know, not everybody was a Marine like I was and doesn't really care and can tell people, <laughs> you know, hey, yeah. you're, you're being an idiot, you need to stop being an idiot. Mm. Uh, but, and you know, or a hockey player where you just whack them upside the head if they need to. <laughs> so, but sometimes we try to be too nice. Yeah. And I think sometimes in a loving way, all jokes aside, in a loving way, we need to tell people, you're not being very Christian right now. Mm. And if you have a legitimate issue, you need to bring that to the table and use appropriate channels. But quite frankly, through all this last year, the election the last, the year before that, I was offended by the way Christians talk and speak about anything. Whether mm. you agree with a mandate or don't agree with a mandate, whether you agree with a political party or you don't agree with a political party, how we talk about others reflects who we are yeah. and it reflects the one we serve. Mm -hmm. And that ought not to happen, especially when we're talking about pastors. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a couple of different reasons why pastors leave. One of those is financial too. So recognize, is your pastor working a full-time job along with being a pastor? Because that's becoming more and more common. And then the question is, pastor, what can I take off your plate? Yeah. What can I do for you? Because then you realize he's not just working as everybody else has a job, but he's also working to shepherd a flock as well. So mm -hmm. can you help him? At, is there something I can do for you that maybe helps get a job done that, yeah. you know, can I mow your lawn? You know, little things like oh, that, wow. that, yeah. that can take time so that he can spend more time with his family or more time studying, especially if they have another job. So if I'm hearing you all correctly, it's, it's not so much big things you're looking for from folks in your congregations that are encouraging. There, there's just a lot of like, showing up to services, mm -hmm. uh, being available. Uh, yes, whether it's mowing their lawn or whatever. How about, how about you, Pastor? What else do you see? What encourages you as a pastor from your congregation? I could boil that all down to one word, unity. Yeah? yeah. Unity. Yeah. If you can have unity, you can have peace. Mm -hmm. If you can have peace, you can have progress. Mm -hmm. So we just need more unity, whether there's a form of division Division needs marginalized. <laughs> That's yeah. what needs to happen. Yeah. You need to marginalize division and fill that space with unity and love. Because we like to put labels on things and it separates mm -hmm. folks. Don't yeah. It? Yeah. Just yeah. marginalize that. Keep your focus where your focus is supposed to be. Okay. And be unified and move ahead together. Well, let's move on to the next question here. Uh, talking about work and about your job. It says, I don't like my job. That's what this person's saying. The people I work with are toxic. But I feel like God has to be in this place for a re or has me in this place for a reason. So I'm not going to look for another job. Can you give me encouragement to keep pushing through the difficult moments? I'll give you one statement. You might be the only Jesus that some people see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to be in a position. I remember working in a job where 
Everyone around you is, is telling those jokes and saying those things, and you're the one who's the outsider. Mm. But remember that Jesus was the outsider. And if you're, the, if you're there simply to change one person, just by living like Jesus, it's worth it. Yeah, yes. I worked in a factory before I became a pastor. Uh, I didn't get my calling until I was 42 years old. And, um, and the one thing I noticed in the factory was that, um, that people would make fun of me as a new Christian uh, until they had problems in their life and then they wanted somebody oh, to talk to. Oh, then all of a sudden they wanted you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, I would encourage this person to, hmm. to keep demonstrating a Christ-like attitude. Um, it doesn't mean you have to get walked on all the time, um, but, but you have to remain calm and, and you know, demonstrate the attributes that Christ would want you to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and wait and see how many people come to you when, when trouble strikes in their life. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So they may, they may be evil and vile and, and do a lot of cussing at work, but everybody goes through times of struggle and, and everybody needs somebody now and then. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true, yes. And I would say, you know, Scripture says whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it doesn't matter what we do. If we're a dishwasher, if we're a physician, if we're a pastor, if we work on the assembly line, we, we do it with integrity. We do it in a, in a character, in a way that we do it as unto the Lord. But I would also say, if you're going to stay, stay for the right reasons. Like, don't fool yourself. Don't, don't stay because I'm afraid. I don't think my skills are marketable. You know, mm. don't, don't, don't stay because you think you're the martyr. Don't stay with a, you know, a pharisaical, pompous attitude like I'm the Jesus here, you know, uh, and I'm going to stick it out. If you're going to stay, stay with the attitude of being humble like oh, Jesus yeah. and serving. And I would also say, you know, in the question it was, I work with toxic people. Mm -hmm. The best thing that you can do is pray. Mm -hmm. Pray for your enemies. Yeah. Pray, pray for the people in that place. Imagine the things that will change. Put, put a prayer box on your desk and invite people to drop prayers in and let them know that you'll pray for those things anonymously if they want. Mm. And, you know, you're going to get some things that are inappropriate, put those in the shredder. You're going to get some things that people genuinely want prayer. And as God works through that, you're going to see mountains move. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. And above all else, um, make sure that God wants you there. Because a lot of people get fooled into thinking God wants them there when they're just afraid to move on. Mm, yeah. okay. So don't blame it on God if, if you're afraid to move on. <laughs> well, I, I know too that chances are if you, you do get another job, it's probably going to be toxic too. I mean, it's very rarely do you find a place that's not. Yeah. The yeah. grass is not always green Correct. on the other side. That's true. That's true. Gentlemen, I'd love to continue this conversation, but we are basically out of time here on Life Questions. Thanks so much for spending your uh, a half hour here with us. We deeply appreciate it. And we'll see you next time with more of Life Questions. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>